And uh, yeah, as we, as I mentioned already, the, we're going to talk about burning fat. But uh, when I when I say you burning fat, that I'm not necessarily meaning that you know losing your body fat. You know, burning fat also kind of coincides with the idea of uh, what kind of metabolic processes your body is going through on the mitochondrial level. Like uh, how does your body produce energy on the cellular level? And uh, there's those sort of you know nuances and differences that have to taken into account, so it's not always just losing, losing weight, you can kind of burn fat without losing weight as well, so we'll talk about it in closer, but yeah, the idea is that turn your, turn your body into this machinery that is, you know, using fat as a primary fuel source, and uh, that's going to help you to lose weight as well, it's like a side, side effect of it, and uh, yeah, when you look at it, your general uh, the human body then the fat is like a very viable source it's like needed for survival and uh, especially you know surviving periods of famine and surviving you know situations of energy energy scarcity in the savanna and the jungle you, you need a lot of body fat you want to have body fat but in the modern world it's like not not uh, that uh, ideal because you know we have food everywhere around us and people tend to consume more calories than they need and uh, the amount of energy people carry around with them is also quite significant and substantial. Like uh, even people with you know 10% body fat, they still have you know thousands and thousands of calories with them all the time, over 30,000 calories with them. And you know imagine if people who aren't even lean, you know they have like 100,000 of calories, and uh, that can cover literally like weeks and months of food or of energy. And uh, the general simplistic overview of how to lose body fat is the calories in versus calories out module of, you know, uh, you burn more calories than you consume during a day, and that's going to create a caloric deficit. And uh, the, the calories you kind of miss out on, your body is going to take it from your body fat stores. So, like, that's the general, that, that is the truth, that the general mechanism, and that's the simplistic view of uh, looking at it. So, if, you, for instance, uh, if you consume 3,000 calories and you burn 2,500 calories, then those 500 extra calories will uh, either be burnt off or they will be stored as body fat. And uh, if you want to lose body fat, then you have to kind of reverse it. You have to consume 2,500 calories and burn 3,000 calories, if that makes sense. But there are some other things that have to be kept in mind. And yeah, like <laughs> the more complex complex view is that you know there are many other hormonal and metabolic pro processes of going on and all of them affect this calories in versus calories out module and uh, you know it's not that simple there are some uh, things that can make it easier and some things that can uh, com completely inhibit the process so yeah like for example you know not just losing weight isn't always the ideal thing to strive towards you, you can lose weight at the expense of muscle tissue and uh, you can co cause more damage to your body because of that. So the goal of any diet or uh, weight loss strategy is, is never to lose muscle. The goal is to always lose more fat and uh, spare more muscle tissue because muscle tissue is uh, much more you know, optimal for the body composition and longevity. Uh, muscle is more valuable and it's more metabolically active as well. Mm, and uh, these are the energy stores the body has and previously I said that a lot of people have uh, so many stored body fat calories then this is an example of you know usually over 100,000 calories almost and uh, the other other energy sources that the body has are in the form of glycogen and uh, glycogen is stored glucose or uh, stored carbohydrate molecules that your body is going to uh, you, uh, deposit in uh, muscle cells and in liver cells and it's going to use it for like different energy requirements He's, it's going to use it more like more intense activities and uh, whenever it actually needs so in order to get access to your body fat then the body the body has like many other uh, these different smaller stores that need to be burned through first before it gets access to the body fat uh, because like the from an evolutionary perspective then you know the body wants to hold onto the fat because it thinks it's going to starve, but uh, it doesn't. It can't, you know, see foresee in the future that it's not actually going to uh, run into any troubles. To to tap into the body fat stores, you need to only deplete the liver glycogen, 
and the, there is about 100 grams of liver glycogen in, uh, in the liver. And in muscle glycogen, uh, there's about 400 to 500 grams of glycogen. And the muscle glycogen is used more for uh, like uh, intense exercise and uh, you know lifting weights, sprinting, jumping, stuff that kind of get your heart rate uh, elevated. So you don't you don't you don't necessarily need to burn through the muscle glycogen because it's more of like like a jet fuel for these emergency situations. Whereas liver glycogen is simply for balancing your blood sugar and uh, regulating the hormones. So uh, the the depleting the liver glycogen is where the key. So if you deplete the liver glycogen or if you keep it relatively low, then the body can get access to its body fat stored more easily. Can I ask a question? Yeah. During the physical trainings, hard workouts like bodybuilders are running, can it be that both glycogens are burned? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Are you fall unconscious of it? <laughs> no, it's not necessarily. Like, yeah. I'm, we're going to talk about what happens if you deplete the glycogen, but yeah, yeah bodybuilding exercises and gym workouts, they do deplete yeah. both, of, both of them. And uh, that, that in turn is making the body more uh, easily accessible to the body fat stores. And then the fat is burning faster? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. in a sense. Okay. Thanks. And so, when you do deplete the liver glycogen, uh, then the liver is going to respond by starting to convert the fatty acids into these things called ketone bodies. And ketone bodies are the byproducts of uh, fatty acid metabolism. You can create ketone bodies whether with uh, like eating dietary fat as well, uh, or you're converting your own body fat into ketones. So uh, it depends on like what, how many calories you consume beforehand. But generally, like uh, once the liver glycogen gets depleted, then then the liver will then start to produce ketones as a fuel substrate, as in like uh, like a different kind of fuel source. And uh, those ketones will then start to circulate the bloodstream, where they will give uh, fuel to muscles. And they're also going to feed the brain, so that's like a critical. They're going to substitute for the glucose, and they're like almost uh, evolution or like in in like very energy demanding situations. They're like very invaluable. If you do if you do face starvation or famine, then those ketones bodies are going to basically keep you alive. Mm, and how fast does your liver glycogen usually get depleted? Uh, Generally, it's going to take about 16 to 20 hours just by doing nothing uh, to deplete your liver glycogen if you don't do anything at all. And uh, that's, that happens just, just so you could uh, maintain like a stable blood sugar uh, throughout the day. Like liver glycogen is supporting uh, the blood sugar and it's also going to give them some glucose to the brain. So uh, if you don't do anything at all, if you just you know, sit in your bed, then it's going to take about 16 to 20 hours to deplete the liver glycogen, but it can be accelerated with physical exercise as well. If you go for a run or, or a short jog, then you can you know, deplete the liver glycogen even within like 10 hours and, or faster. And uh, those exogenous, this is a diagram of showing uh, glucose utilization. And uh, for instance, those exogenous, exogenous glucose would mean that you, know, you eat something and after a few hours, your uh, glucose levels will drop again, and uh, you will more. You will start to use more glycogen, uh, the liver glycogen for stabilizing your blood sugar, and you know that's going to drop again after after a few hours. And usually, in response, the body is going to respond. You know, as your as your as your glycogen stores get depleted, you know, uh, gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis are going to start to gradually increase. So this this sort of a dichotomy of you know your your uh, your uh, glycogen stores get depleted and you start progressively burn more body fat or you know convert your body fat into those uh, energy substrates. Can you explain glucogenesis? Well, gluconeogenesis is basically the liver converting or the liver creating uh, glucose, whether from fat or uh, or or any amino acids. So yeah, it's simply a way of creating glucose for the brain. And this uh, This is basically you ate something ex exogenous carbohydrates. Like you eat them, you eat carbohydrates, okay. and after a while, you know, four hours or something, then you're gonna start using glycogen because the blood sugar is gonna drop. Okay. 
And uh, that's another way of looking at it. You know, if your carbohydrate stores or if your glycogen stores are empty, then uh, you're using more fat. And if your carbohydrate stores and glycogen stores are full, then you're burning a lot of carbohydrates and almost not, not no fat at all. And uh, if you're somewhere in the middle, if you're balanced out, then you know it's 50-50 or something, some sort of a mixture. So uh, <coughs> that's how the body kind of kind of responds to these. Uh, I do these uh, fuel fuel sources, and yeah, once once uh, the uh, the glycogen runs out, then the fat that you do have in your system is going to be converted into ketones by the liver. So, like a simplistic way of looking at it, and and like I said earlier, fat loss doesn't equal or fat, you know weight loss can equal. Weight loss itself isn't always ideal. You don't want to lose just water or muscle and just a little bit of fat. You want to use primarily fat. And uh, that's the key idea of priming your body into this ketogenic state and putting yourself into ketosis uh, where your body will be using those fats and or using your own body fat to uh, maintain energy. And uh, that, that's the idea is to get into ketosis and to have relatively low levels of liver glycogen so the body can get access to it faster because if you have you know if you don't get into ketosis and you have a lot of glycogen around but you still go on a diet to eat fewer calories then the the, the potential danger is that like in the previous slide you're gonna end up losing a lot of muscle so that's not ideal if you are in ketosis then you will take all the energy you need or the energy deficit that you come across all of that deficit will be covered with your body fat if you're in ketosis uh, yeah I have a question why uh, uh, in ketosis uh, there is no muscle loss well it's it is like a little bit of muscle loss but it's more it's less it's less drastic. It's much more, much more uh, conservative in a sense because ketones, they have uh, muscle sparing properties and uh, they do kind of protect the body against cannibalizing its own tissue. Because if your body uh, runs out of glucose, runs out of liver glycogen, and it still wants to have a glycogen or it still needs glucose to maintain energy for the brain then it's going to turn into this gluconeogenesis of muscle tissue and it's going to start converting its own muscles into glucose and sugar so that it could give the brain energy. But if you are in ketosis, then your brain doesn't need that much glucose because the ketones will going to substitute for that. So the demand for glucose is going to be much lower throughout the entire body and especially in the brain. So it's uh, the, there is no need to burn your muscle tissue and uh, your body will get more access to the body fat stores if it's in ketosis. So it kind of uh, protects against that. Mm, and uh, the, ke the ketogenic diet itself uh, is going to put you into the state of ketosis with uh, food and uh, nutrition. And uh, there's a like, very unique way of doing it. Uh, when on the right, there is the you know, standard Western diet where you know, generally people tend to fall, they usually eat maybe like 50% carbohydrates, 15% protein, and maybe 30% fat, then the ketogenic diet is going to be somewhere around 20% you know, protein, 5% carbohydrates, like very low carbohydrates, and primarily fat. So the idea is that if you're not eating a lot of carbohydrates, then your liver glycogen will be lower all the time, and uh, the body will then have more access to ketones and it can tap into ketosis more frequently all the time. So it's always always very able to burn its own body fat. And uh, yeah, if you if you are eating a lot of carbohydrates, then you're gonna constantly fill out the liver glycogen, and that's gonna signal the body that we don't need to burn body fat. We have enough liver glycogen around, and we don't need to do it. And uh, the keto food pyramid or the foods you do eat. Uh, are you know low carb and a little bit higher in fat so the foods usually are some sort of fatty meats chicken fish uh, eggs cheese vegetables broccoli cabbage some uh, nuts and seeds avocado some healthy fats like olive oil butter and uh, like very little bit of berries and tomatoes and uh, carrots or something that have like more carbohydrates but generally 
very low carbohydrates and uh, more fats and proteins. And what you do exclude are things like bread, pasta, potatoes, sugar, milk, corn, beans, rice, those sort of things, because they're higher in, higher in carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Milk. Milk. Well, it's, milk is okay, but uh, this, this is simply like, milk would be pasteurized milk, and the, the ones you get at supermarkets, they tend to have some sugars or something, and they're not, you know, they're not that, not that healthy, but they, they, they do fit into the keto pyramid. You can drink milk or kefir or cottage cheese or, or something like that, no problem. And usually, in most cases, you know, the macronutrients of a, of a standard keto diet would be, you know, 60% fat, 30% protein, and, you know, 5 to 10% carbs or something. But it's, you know, you don't have to count your carbs or you don't have to count your calories that, that, you know, specifically as long as you, you know, eat low carb and uh, get, get enough of the proteins and fats. I have a question. Maybe, maybe it's better to answer later. I don't know if you have a slide for this. But uh, what's the difference between a uh, low carb diet and a uh, keto diet? Mm -hmm. You said you don't need to track, uh, you just eat low carbs. Right, right. Uh, well, a low carb diet would be, you know, depends on how, how many carbs you, you categorize as a low carb and such. Some people say that, you know, 200 grams of carbs is low carb, but uh, it's simply semantics. It's individual, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's going to depend on that. but. Um, I myself don't really pay that much attention to it, you know, uh, I do kind of focus on simply ex excluding the high carb foods and eating the low carb foods and uh, if you do eat, you know, in order to kick yourself out of ketosis with broccoli and cabbage you would have to consume like two kilos, two kilograms or something, so it's not, uh, not very easy to do and it's already, even though you may be consuming like 100 grams of carbs from broccoli, it's still going to maintain ketosis. But it's really easy to kick yourself out of ketosis. Of course, of course, but uh, you know, uh, you're going to get back into it faster as well. Like uh, if you eat these low carb vegetables and you, you know, go through an overnight fast, you wake up in the morning, then you're already going to be in this very ketogenic state and burning your own body fat. So it's not going to matter that much over the, long, over the course of you know, several days. I mean, if you are just slightly out of ketosis, would you start getting fat? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's like uh, being in ketosis isn't necessarily going to mean that you're going to burn fat or lose weight. You also have to be in like a small caloric deficit. But if you are in ketosis with a caloric deficit, then the body will be more prioritized to burning the body fat and uh, things like that and to preserve the muscle. Uh, whereas if you if you are in a caloric deficit uh, without being in ketosis, then you're gonna you know potentially lose some of the water or some of the muscle tissue, and uh, also like uh, being kicked out of ketosis doesn't mean that uh, you won't lose fat. You can still lose fat if you aren't in ketosis. It's simply like a metabolic state uh, that is kind of changing some of the metabolic pathways that your body is going going through, but, which is like. In my opinion, it's more, much more beneficial and more strategic way of going about it. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in terms of like losing or inducing a inducing caloric deficit uh, more easily, then it's also important to pay attention to satiety and actually the feeling of you know that you are fulfilled. And uh, in that sense. Uh, it's also important to pay attention to foods that you know have more volume and uh, they do satiate you and for instance this is a good example of you know even though 400 calories of oil or some butter or something is like very small it's not going to fill you up that much and uh, versus the other side where 400 calories of vegetables would you know require a lot of food in volume and it, it actually you know fills you up so uh, on the keto diet, you kind of blend them together in a sense that most of the volume in food comes from the vegetables and most of the calories come from the, these other, other sources like meats or oils. But uh, in order to lose, lose weight, then it's easier to focus still on like a, lot of, a lot of vegetables and the things that fill you up and make it easier for you to sustain a caloric deficit. 
and generally a regular low carb keto uh, you know meal would look something along the lines of that 50% of the plate would be some sort of a fatty meat like red meat or chicken and the other part would be some uh, low carb veggies uh, some salads or broccoli or some cruciferous and just a little bit of extra fat uh, not too, not too much but you know just enough to satiate you and uh, make you feel fulfilled so yeah like if you look at it then these these vegetables they don't have a lot of calories but they're like larger in volume and uh, size so they're gonna fill you up much more versus the fatty meat uh, it's it's smaller in size but it has more calories so it's gonna uh, still uh, you know calories do matter to a certain point but uh, it's easier to you know be filled up <laughs> with some vegetables and then eat your calories later and what you don't want to be eating uh, in any diet basically are these trans fats and the vegetable oils you know things you get from margarine uh, processed foods and also like these vegetable oils like canola oil, sunflower oil, uh, rapeseed oil and uh, you especially don't want to heat them too much because uh, they tend to get uh, rancid and oxidized which is going to cause some inflammation in the body and insulin resistance as well so that, that, again, that, that will kind of hinder your body's ability to utilize carbohydrates and uh, burn fat as well because it's going to cause some damage into the body so like the, the types of fats are quite important as well and you don't want to be you know causing damage to your uh, your metabolic processes uh, wh what's so bad about uh, rapeseed oil well it's inherently it's not bad but you know uh, it's 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 a matter of balance your body is always trying to your your body functions best when it um, has a balance of both the omega 3s and omega 6 fatty acids and uh, generally like if you offset those uh, if you offset the balance then you're going to be more pro-inflammatory and generally rapeseed oil and uh, those sorts of things they they're more in the omega 6 uh, realm and they're higher in omega 6s which uh, will you know offset this balance and it can uh, cause more inflammation as, and especially if you heat it with cooking, then you know, uh, rapeseed oil also has like quite a low smoking point, and it's gonna become oxidized, and that can cause more inflammation even further. And the problem is that most people aren't getting enough of the omega threes in their diet, and uh, it's simply uh, generally the standard Western diet, it's something along the lines of twenty to one in favor of the omega sixes, so like twenty times more omega six fatty acids in favor or in. in compared to the omega-3s, so uh, it's, it's not that those things are inherently bad, it's just that we're already getting so many omega-6 fatty acids that we don't need any more, and uh, we would actually be better off by getting more of the omega-3s from like fish and, uh, and things, like, things like that. I think most of the omega-6s come from the bad, bad oils you just mentioned, but I'll check uh, once more with the rapeseed oil because I uh, have in memory that the ratio was quite okay, so... Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you when right. I find it. Gener generally, the best fats to cook are something like uh, coconut oil or uh, avocado oil or lard or tallow or something with a higher smoking point. Uh, so insulin, insulin is uh, the storage hormone of, the, of, your, of your body and uh, insulin is, gets elevated when you do consume things like carbohydrates and sugars so uh, your blood sugar goes up and the, the pancreas <coughs> is going to release insulin which will then go towards the cells and it's going to unlock the cells so the glucose can enter into the uh, cells and get stored as glycogen so generally higher levels of insulin make your body more prone to store the food that you eat uh, and versus the opposite low levels of insulin are going to allow the body to be burning more fat and make it easier to access it and uh, because like insulin also has a counter hormone called, called uh, glucagon so if insulin goes down glucagon goes up and glucagon is going to start breaking down your glycogen stores and uh, that's going to help you to deplete the liver glycogen faster so in most cases 
you do want to maintain a relatively low, low, low uh, level of insulin and uh, low blood sugar as well because it's even healthier, it's, it's going to prevent diabetes and insulin resistance, but it's also going to help you to burn more fat. And uh, yeah, usually high levels of insulin come from consuming too many carbohydrates, eating too frequently, that's another issue, like having three to five small meals a day, that's another way you're spiking insulin up all the time. And, uh, not, and being sedentary, not, not exercising, those can all spike insulin and that makes your body more prone to store uh, you know, the food you eat. And the opposite, low levels of insulin can come from eating low carb, uh, practicing a little bit of fasting and exercising. Those things will deplete your glycogen and they will also make you more insulin sensitive and keep it more uh, lower. Can I ask about this frequent eating? If you are doing sports, then uh, usually trainer says just keep eating small snacks right, right. because then you keep the metabolism very fast. Mm. How about that? Uh, we're going to talk about fasting uh, up next, but generally, like uh, it's fasting doesn't actually slow down the metabolism. Mm. Uh, only your body is quite resilient. Like if you eat only once a day, it's not going to affect your metabolism as long as you eat enough calories. Like usually your metabolism gets slow get, gets slowed down if you eat less calories as well. If you combine mm -hmm. it with you know too much caloric restriction, like uh, you do eat like very you know like barely any calories at all, it's, that's naturally going to slow down the metabolism. But it's not inherently connected to the fasting or meal frequency. Okay. So that's like if if you looked at many studies that have done comparing different uh, eating frequencies, then uh, they're almost the same, and there isn't like a much difference. Like even if you consume all the food in one meal or in four meals, the weight loss can be still the same. So yeah, uh, let's talk about fasting. And uh, these are this is an illustration of uh, how the traditional three meals a day how it affects this uh, process of burning fat. And uh, the red blimps are spikes of insulin that happen. And imagine, yeah, like you have breakfast, you spike insulin, and uh, before lunchtime, you drop into this very mild fat burning state where you do may deplete your some of the food that you eat in breakfast. You experience like maybe, maybe a little bit of ketosis, but you, you know, eat lunch again and you prevent it from happening again. And, you know, the same happens at dinner. And the only time you do get into this severe fat burning state of ketosis happens in the night uh, when you're sleeping and when you're, when you're not eating. So even with 12 hours of eating, you don't actually experience a lot of this ketogenic state if you're doing like the traditional way of eating. And uh, compare it to if you simply skip one meal and you confine the eating window to let's say eight hours, then uh, you're gonna drastically change the situation because you're gonna skip one insulin spike and uh, you're gonna allow the body to maintain this fat burning state that you experience during the night throughout the entire morning. And uh, that is gonna you know, rev up more ketones and uh, that's gonna put you into deeper ketosis and that can make it easier for you to create a caloric deficit as well. You simply skip one meal and uh, you don't even have to feel that you're depriving yourself from food because you still get to eat like two meals, which are gonna be larger in a sense. And uh, yeah, generally, you well, you can you can even do it like once. It doesn't matter. Like if you have, if you want to uh, go into deeper ketosis or uh, you know lower your insulin further, it's it's simply an example of how, how fasting or kind of confining the time of when you eat is going to allow you to uh, be more in a ketogenic state. And. Uh, that is, you know, the most easiest way of going about it is to simply follow this very popular eating window called, you know, 16 and 8, where you fast 16 hours and you eat your food within 8 hours. And uh, what it usually entails is that you maybe skip, uh, skip breakfast, have lunch and dinner. And uh, that's going to cover, you know, the 8 hours. And it doesn't have to be that strict. You can, you know, play around with it. Fast 14 hours, eat within 10 hours. Fast uh, 18 hours, eat within 6 hours. Fast 20 hours, eat within 4 hours or something, depending on the situation. And uh, the benefit of it is that uh, it's going to uh, keep you in uh, 
deeper ketosis, at least for the morning parts of the day, and that's going to have like a better body composition effect where you're burning primarily fat, not muscle, or losing, losing water weight. So they, they have done some studies where they compare uh, time-restricted eating versus three, three meals a day, and they found that you know, even though the difference is minute, usually people who do intermittent fasting, they tend to be burning more fat versus the ones who constantly eat three meals or even six meals a day, they tend to lose slightly more muscle. So it's more of like uh, the aspect of being in ketosis for longer is going to allow the body to you know, burn more fat instead of muscle. And uh, what, during that 16 hour period, 16 hour window or the fasting window, uh, then the idea is to not consume any calories and uh, only be consuming things that are, you know, don't kick you out of the fasting state or kick you out of ketosis. And generally what you can consume are things like water, tea and black coffee. So uh, those things are you know, allowed within the fasting window and they do, do make it very easy. And uh, they, you don't even have to, you know, in my opinion, once you kind of get used to it, then it's no difference and it's very easy to stick to. And it's very, actually very enjoyable as well because uh, you do kind of enjoy, or not enjoy, but let's say you kind of savor the, the aspect of uh, being very mentally clear and uh, not feeling any tiredness or something. Because the ketones do have like a really good brain boosting effect as well because they're going to give your brain energy. Like, because if you were to be on the sugar, sugar burning roller coaster, then uh, you can experience these hop, ups and downs of uh, sugar crashes. You eat, you feel energized, but after a while you crash again. You have to eat again to kind of bring yourself up. And that's the idea of eating three to six small meals a day all the time and running these ups and downs all the time. But if you are eating like a low carb diet and you are in ketosis, then uh, you don't have to worry about running into an energy crisis because your brain has all the time access to your own body fat. It's like literally tapped into it and it takes all the glucose or the, all the ketones it needs from the body fat and kind of maintains this very good mental clarity throughout the entire day. How bad it is to add a little bit of milk to typical Well, it's not going to be that bad. Like, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, let's say like one t tablespoon or two tablespoons is not going to inherently kick, kick you out of ketosis. And it's not gonna, you know, prevent any fat loss either. Like if you do still maintain like a lower lower caloric intake throughout the day, it's not gonna be that bad. Uh, if it like if it if it allows you to fast for longer, then it's gonna be worth it in the long term. And yeah, like that's 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 another question was that you can you can add a little bit of you know cream or a little bit of milk into the coffee to postpone the caloric intake or the postpone the fasting window. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit about exercise and when you are, you know, going about your business during the day, you're moving around and, uh, you know, doing some daily chores around the city or something, then in that state, you, you're like very low intensity and uh, you're not you know, having your heart rate elevated and you're not burning muscle glycogen. It's like a very easy, easy going state. And in that state, you are burning primarily body fat. Your body will use or prefer body fat for, for that situation because it's not that demanding. And uh, if you scale things up, if, as, as the intensity of your movement starts to increase, then uh, that will also increase the amount of carbohydrates and glycogen you're gonna burn. So, for instance, yeah, like you're walking, you're burning fat, but if you're sprinting, then you're burning primarily glycogen and uh, carbohydrates. So it's like the crossover effect of uh, where, yeah, you, as you scale things up, the body will then kind of prioritize more glycogen because it's its backup fuel for you know running away from lions or or dodging some sort of some sort of uh, boulders. But yeah, basically, that's, that's a simple, simpler way of looking at how, how does the body use these different fuel sources. And uh, in training, then it also corresponds with the idea of aerobic training and anaerobic training. Aerobic training is where you're uh, primarily burning 
facts and to, to maintain the exercise and during anaerobic training you're going to be using glycogen but the, the, the idea or the let's say the problem is that necessarily the goal isn't to be burning only fat with aerobic exercise and the goal should be actually to focus primarily on anaerobic exercise and uh, to deplete the glycogen because that again is going to send like a different stimulus to the body and it's going to tell it's going to send a different kind of a signal of adaptation uh, where in, in the example of aerobic exercise then you're not going to be you know getting any better uh, in terms of like the way your body uses these energy, energy sources uh, if you're doing an anaerobic training then you're also going to stimulate muscle growth, you're also going to make you more insulin sensitive, you're going to deplete the glycogen and uh, that's going to create like a net positive effect for the body in the future. For instance, if you have more muscle, then you're going to increase your daily caloric balance as well. You can get away with eating more calories while still losing fat because you have more muscle mass. Like muscle burns more calories than fat and uh, it makes you more insulin sensitive and it's like a huge sponge of both carbohydrates and, uh, and the general calories. So uh, it's going to increase, basically make your body more capable of burning fat in the future. It may be true that with aerobic exercise you're burning more calories during the activity itself, but uh, when you're resting then you're not going to be burning any calories. You, know, you can go for a run on a treadmill, but once you stop then your body gonna go back, but if you lift weights or if you do high intensity interval training or something like that, that's gonna deplete the glycogen, then it's gonna send the body, send the signal to the body that okay, we need to burn fat in the future again as well because we ramped up the metabolic processes and we you know we want to build muscle or we need to build muscle in the future. Both are good, but you know the focus should actually be, be primarily on anaerobic training and uh, try to build more muscle because it makes it easier to diet and makes it easier to uh, you know, live in the modern world as well. And uh, that can also be seen you know, in the different sports, like marathon runners who are doing primarily aerobics. Uh, they don't have like, very uh, you know, muscular or aesthetically pleasing bodies because they, they're kind of trying to prioritize the idea of we need to lose the muscle because aerobic training is like endurance based you don't want to have higher body weight you want to be very skinny and and uh, you want to lose the muscle basically when you're doing marathons uh, versus on the other hand if you're doing like anaerobic training like sprinting then it's going to send like a completely different signal to the body that we need the muscle and we need to be leaner and we don't need the fat we need the muscle so it's like a different different idea so yeah like Generally, most of the time, the anaerobic training is going to be simply, you know, more more effective and going to give you more results. And again, like uh, even though fat tissue may be larger in size, it's going to burn less calories. Like one pound of fat is going to burn about five calories, versus one pound of muscle is going to burn fifty calories. So imagine. If you you know have more muscle mass, then it's easier for you to stay lean, stay healthy uh, throughout the entire year, and you don't have to worry about getting fat or not that easy, easily. <laughs> so how do you build muscle? And generally, the best way to do it, go about it, is to focus on compound exercises. Compound exercises are these multi-joint exercises that stimulate the entire body, and uh, they're like require you to contract multiple muscle groups at the same time and that's going to basically send the signal to the body that okay we need to be seriously it's going to activate these different muscle building pathways and uh, isolation exercises they aren't they can they do can be effective but they're not going to be as uh, as as beneficial for general uh, strength and muscle growth and isolation exercises are things like you know biceps curls or leg extensions that, that uh, isolate the movement. But these things, they're going to be burning more calories and these things, combat exercises, are going to be uh, building more muscle as well. So these, these compound exercises are 
uh, things like squats, uh, bench press, deadlift, barbell row, overhead press, and pull-ups. So these are basically the only gym exercises you would ever need to do, and uh, those things will but basically going kind to of give you like the 80% of the results that you would ever need, and uh, they are they're the most effective ones. And the other ones, you know, like doing bicep curls or such, they they can be like accessories or something to add, but they're not they shouldn't be your focus because these things are going to be the one the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, but what about aerobics? Uh, when you're doing things like cardio or running then uh, you shouldn't go into the anaerobic zone that much because uh, it can you know, deplete the glycogen and it can make you lose a lot of the muscle. And uh, when you, whenever you're doing cardio or something, then you want to be staying uh, relatively at a relatively low intensity where you're burning primarily fat instead of glycogen, like under the 70% of your EO2 max. And uh, usually, the, a good indicator for that is like if you're able to breathe through your nose, then you're in this aerobic zone and you're burning a primarily fat. Whereas if you start to you know gasp through your mouth of you know trying to get more air, you can't breathe through your nose anymore. Then it's a sign of you're going into the anaerobic zone and you're becoming more glycolytic, and uh, that can be a dangerous sign of you know sending your body the wrong signal of what we need to lose the muscle. So if you were to stay within the aerobic zone of being able to breathe through your nose easily while still you know, running around or you know, maintaining, the relatively, uh, re maintaining a relatively stable pace, then uh, it's a sign of that you're in the aerobic zone and uh, that can be easier for, for fat loss in a sense. Uh, a little bit of, about the fat cells themselves. There are actually different types of fat cells uh, white fat cells are the most predominant ones in most people and uh, they're white because they have this huge large droplet and uh, white fat cells tend to be tend to be used only for like energy maintenance like if you don't eat for a few days then you're gonna burning off those white fat cells uh, versus on the other hand the brown fat cells are brown because they have like a lot of these mitochondria in them. These mitochondria are these organelles that uh, produce energy, like literally like trillions of mitochondria in your body. And they are the ones that convert all the sunlight, all the food, all the oxygen into energy. So you, without mitochondria, you would die, basically. And uh, the brown fat cells are very high in these uh, mitochondria, and that's why they're brown as well. And the brown fat cells are also and uh, they also they can be also used for uh, temperature regulation, and uh, that's how like when you start to shiver, then you're creating a little bit of the brown fat cells. Or if you already have some of the brown fat cells, then you're gonna burn fat as well. Uh, whereas if you were to have a lot of white fat cells, then that necessarily isn't gonna happen because they're less less effective or they're less or they're more dysfunctional in a sense. So having more brown fat is healthier even if you are like a little bit overweight, then the brown fat cells are gonna be simply healthier in the long term because they're gonna cause less inflammation and it's gonna maintain insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Question, how to find out what kind of fats I have? <laughs> brown ones or white ones? Yeah, like uh, they can be measured with some like DEXA scans and or some other tests, but uh, I don't know like... Estonia? Maybe, maybe in some place, but uh, you can't you, you can't really feel what kind of you have. We have everyone has different proportions of each, uh, but uh, usually the the brown fat cells are somewhere around this upper chest and upper upper back area. So yeah, like upper back and upper chest, those are the most areas where your brown fat gets deposited. So the belly and legs can be white ones. Yeah, you, usually they are. And yeah, like taking, taking, taking ice baths or taking cold showers or going outside without any clothes during the winter time is gonna burn fat and it's gonna create these brown fat cells and that's like really healthy and uh, it can burn more calories and that's another way of losing, losing weight uh, and like an easier way of uh, losing it. But yeah, the, the general idea would be that if you want to 
you know, prime your body to get access to more for its own body fat stores, then uh, the idea is to keep keep the liver glycogen low so that, you know, the body could tap into ketosis faster and uh, maintain this state of uh, being, a, being of maintain this metabolic flexibility aspect. And the, the easiest way of doing it is to practice some time restricted feeding, some intermittent fasting every day, kind of confining the the time where you consume your food. It doesn't even have to be, you know, uh, less food, but if you kind of cont contract it a little bit, then you're going to gain this metabolic advantage a little bit. And uh, that's going to be very useful. And in general, eating a little bit of fewer carbohydrates is also going to help with that and uh, helps the body to go into ketosis faster. And uh, when it comes to exercise, then the best exercises are to uh, focus on like lifting weights and doing higher intensity exercise that is shorter in time, but it's like more effective in the long term because you can do like hours and hours of cardio, but uh, it's not necessarily going to make your body lose fat in the future. Like versus if you were to do some, lift, if you were to lift some weights for like an hour or something like that, then you're going to send the signal to your body that we need muscle, we don't need the fat. And it's also going to ramp up the met metabolic rate because muscle is going to burn more fat in the future. And, you know, that's like, the, it's, it's very simple. And it kind of contradicts some of the mainstream fitness advice. But if you kind of understand the physiology, then it makes perfect sense of, you know, if you are spiking insulin throughout the day, if you're, keep, if you're eating on carbohydrates all the time, then you're not actually going to allow your body to tap into the body fat stores. And you are running this, you know, constant uh, sugar burning roller coaster. And, uh, you know, that's why most of the people aren't getting the results that they, that they want. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it can be actually quite easy. Like if you s simply stop eating for a while, then uh, you do go into like a very deep ketosis and uh, you do can, you, you can really leverage the ability to burn your own body fat stores, not the glycogen stores. Because if you're eating all the time, then you're going to fill up the liver glycogen and, you know, it's running, running in circles almost. So uh, probably maybe have some more additional questions, any specific topics that you want to dis discuss about. How to grow the muscle in hmm. such a diet? <laughs> in such a diet, well... Uh, or you need to grow first and then you go into... <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's actually very possible to build muscle with uh, like a low-carb keto diet. Uh, Generally, like to build muscle, then the most important thing is the appropriate stimulus to actually lift weights and to do something that is stimulating the muscle for uh, muscle hypertrophy. And, uh, you know, if you want to build the muscle, then you can't do like a lot of like very low intensity repetitions. You have to be, you have to make it more intense in a sense and uh, make it make focus on like strength building. And that's, that's the main idea of getting stronger, because if you are getting stronger, then it's going to require more muscle mass. And usually when people do go to the gyms, then they do lift weights, but they go for like, you know, 20 reps, 30 reps or something, and they do all the biceps curls and such. That's not going to be like big of enough stimulus for the body to grow. Whereas if you were to focus on like the compound exercise of squats, uh, bench press and barbell rows, then uh, they're gonna first of all they're gonna stimulate more muscle groups and but they're also more difficult, uh, especially if you were to focus like maybe on like ten repetitions only. That's like a completely completely different stimulus. You do less reps, but you do it with heavier weight, and uh, you need to be stronger to lift that weight. So that's the main main uh, main signal that is going to help the body to grow. And secondly, secondly, also like adequate protein intake is also necessary. You do have to be consuming more protein in order to you know build that tissue because the tissue or the muscle tissue itself is made of protein and amino acid building blocks so increasing your protein intake a little bit can be useful for, for that what's the main difference of the content it looks like this would do the same thing as this uh, the the bodybuilding book is going to be focusing primarily on the idea of you know like building muscle and resistance training it has like all the exercises and uh, the programming and uh, and such but uh, this one fasting one is more focused on how to implement the fasting schedule and uh, the different types of fasts like even like the several day fasts of you know three to five days and how to success so this is more like a longevity book 
and this is more like a muscle building book and fat loss book. But this does include some of the fasting, but like a very a little bit, maybe like the 16 and 8 hour window, how to do the daily intermittent fasting. But uh, this one will be like more extended fasting as well, and uh, it's more in depth in this sense. This is like look better, die younger, yeah? <laughs> Well, both of them can kind of complement because, like, uh, the muscle itself can contribute to the lifespan. If, because, like, muscle mass is one of the best kind of pension funds for your aging, and uh, they, they should. It's actually considered uh, a good predictor of longevity and uh, health. More muscle mass. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind.